I'm willing to bet money that in virtually every culture in the world, globally, across every continent, you will see a general consensus that, for example, a five-year-old child is not capable of making decisions that are important in life. So a five-year-old child needs constraints, boundaries, restrictions. Most people in most cultures would probably say, especially in the West or more technologically developed cultures such as East Asia, that a five-year-old child needs to have a strict schedule when it comes to going to bed or that a five-year-old child shouldn't be playing around with weapons, whether knives or guns, or for that matter, that a five-year-old child should be making important decisions about its own nutrition. And so, in general, that's a consensus I'm willing to bet money on that that's the case. I think that most people would say five-year-old children need restrictions, they need to be constrained in their behavior. Now, why am I talking about this? I'm talking about this because it touches upon many things I've talked about in the past, including in my previous video, the video about the new age of simpism, as it were. And much of this is down to the fact that we have lost all sense of constraint in our society. I want you to think about something. For most people, at least the general social consensus is such, from zero to 18, a child, then a minor, and then all of a sudden, you hit age 18, and you are, at least according to the law, as well as social convention, endowed with magical powers. The power to decide all kinds of things about yourself, about the rest of society. And I'm going to propose to you that I find that questionable. Or more broadly, that, and here's the shocker, that there's really a truly profound difference between an adult say in his 20s or 30s or even 40s or 50s, and a child. Now, of course, there are profound differences physiologically, neurologically, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that adults are basically children. They're not interchangeable. But the idea that adults need fewer of the constraints than children in the broadest sense is something that's very popular. People believe that. And to some degree, it's true. Many adults are capable of driving, Many adults are capable of making decisions a five-year-old could not. But that doesn't mean that adults are capable of everything and that every decision should be greenlit and accepted, which is to say there is no magical number when it comes to human beings that allows us to make consequence-free decisions. And the problem here is that we're not nearly as aware as we are wont to believe when it comes to these decisions and their consequences. So I want to give you some very concrete examples here. If I were to ask you off the top of your head, what countries are the most obese countries in the world, you probably, unless you've actually looked this up and investigated a bit, probably would say the U.S., maybe Mexico, maybe some European country. Good guesses, but all wrong. Top 10 most obese countries in the world are all in the South Pacific. Nauru, Cook Islands, Palau, Marshall Islands, Tuvalu, New Tonga, Samoa, etc., etc. Some of these places have obesity rates exceeding 60%. Not just being fat and overweight, but over that. What's happened here? Well, to be perfectly honest, you have a very poor interaction with the availability of fast food, junk food, and Western food. And people who are, sorry to say, genetically inclined as a population to be addicted to the stuff, to overeat, and to get really, really fat and develop horrible cases of diabetes, among many other illnesses. And you can see that it's very clearly a genetic factor here because it's literally this region that's the most obese region in the world. Why were they hit harder than, say, other places like Japan or even the United States? So we know this is a genetic thing. So let me ask you the question, if we were to go to the South Pacific, to Nauru, the Cook Islands, the Marshall Islands, and say, look, do you think there's more freedom in being able to eat all this junk food and dying effectively of morbid obesity or not having access to this stuff and living healthy, more constrained lives? You see what I'm getting at with this. We'll take the South Pacific again. These people are the most obese people in the world. They're living horrible lives of obese misery, 
with absolutely horrific health consequences. Don't you think they would have been better off without the introduction of these foods? I think so. And maybe they don't even realize it, but if you gave them some time to think about it, they would too. They used to be very fit, very active. That's not the case anymore. Now, this broadly applies to many populations in many countries across the globe, but I'm taking the 10 most obese countries by percentage as an example because they're the hardest hit. This is a classic example, to be perfectly blunt, of constraint actually allowing for more freedom in their lives. If they were healthy and fit, they would be happier, more content, they wouldn't die prematurely, et cetera, et cetera. So we live in this, as I term it, anything goes society, and most people think it's great. It is the culmination, and I hate to use the term, but I will use it, of liberal capitalism. The belief that unhampered freedom is the best thing possible coupled by free access to markets. Now, in some ways, that might be true, but in other ways, and we have to acknowledge the deficits of any system and the deficiencies, that's manifestly not the case. If we return to the example I cited in the previous video, what you effectively have is a kind of tragedy of the commons, in the sense that if you look at Sims as a kind of public good, and Amaranth, as an example, taking advantage of that, she's profiting from it. In this current order that we live in, very few people benefit, they do very well, they suffer less, but the majority of us are not doing as well in the anything goes constraint-free society. And this is really, really easy to see if you just observe things around you. Everything I talked about with respect to the South Pacific Islands with obesity would apply on the individual level. For example, if you have a family with a long history of alcoholism and drinking excessively, you are at greater risk for alcoholism, definitionally because alcoholism has a heritability rate of about 50%, do you gain a benefit then as such an individual by gaining access to alcohol at a young age? I think not, or at any age for that matter. In fact, you would be better off never touching the bottle ever at all. And this is a lesson a lot of people have to learn. Sir Petey the Punani Slayer, Lord of Gingers, as you know, if you looked into his story, was a serial alcoholic for nine years and now he is dry, does not drink a drop. And that's a discipline he needs to maintain. But how much better would have his life been if he had not spent nine years in absolute inebriation? The point I'm trying to drive home here is that quote unquote freedom is not the freedom people imagine it to be. We are at the end of the day, apes, animals, and it's funny in a paradoxical sense that many religious people don't think we're animals but still recognize the need for constraint. A lot of religious doctrine, especially in the context of the so-called three great monotheisms, is about restraint, restriction, etc., etc. And if you look broadly at society, there are very few people these days that are truly thriving and doing very well. Sure, people are getting along more or less, but what you really see is a society that's suffering from a lack of constraint, whether it comes to the obesity epidemic, drug addiction, lack of structure, out of wedlock births, dysfunctional relationships. One after the other, you see a society that's guided basically by no principle of constraint other than the bare minimal ones. And what do we see? We see failure. We see depression. We see deprivation. We see misery. Now, it's funny because people talk these days a lot about luxury beliefs, term coined by Rob Henderson, the psychologist who grew up in foster care. There's one luxury belief among a few others that a lot of people don't talk about because it's not PC to do so. Now, at some point in time, I was taking a walk. I typically listen to a podcast or something that might be of interest. There's not always something of interest. But I was listening to this podcast between Sam Harris and Trigonometry. And this guy, Constantine Kissin, he's the guy who runs the podcast, Trigonometry, tells Sam that you know some people might need religion. Some people might need some kind of religious structure in their lives, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And almost as if on a dare, Sam Harris retorts, 
are you saying some people are too stupid to not do that? And Constantine Kissin didn't really have the guts to say so, but basically Sam tried to do a gotcha, and it worked. Because that's another luxury belief. There are many people in this world, especially those in the lower half of the cognitive divide, so to speak, who really benefit from the structure of religion, be it the metaphysical beliefs or, and I think this is more important, the day-to-day grounding that it gives them. When you look at the dysfunction of the lower classes and even the working classes these days, what do you see? You see a lack of structure. You see a lack of constraint. Where do you see the most addiction, the most out-of-wedlock births, the most dysfunctional relationships? All these problems, alcohol, drugs, obesity, also worse in that class of people. You see a situation where constraint is much needed, and even necessary, in order for these people to live healthy and fulfilled lives. If you give them too much freedom, for example, they're going to suffer more. I mean, what is a better life? A life where you're addicted to opioids, heroin, morbidly obese and stuck in a scooter simply because you're allowed to do so? Or a life in which you're not allowed to do so, but you go to church, you have a family, you have a job, and you feel at least somewhat fulfilled in your life by doing these things? I think it's a no-brainer, basically. And in broader terms, it's simply the case. If you look at people, again, in the lower half of the cognitive divide, you'll notice that the types of work that they prefer doing and, to be perfectly honest, are best at doing are repetitious things, things that have an overarching structure to them that don't throw them any curveballs, that don't force them to be overly creative because perhaps they're not, and so on and so forth. This is another luxury belief that everyone can get by without, say, religious belief, without some kind of overarching structure that tells them, you need to do this. Some people can do that, but that's not the majority of people and certainly not the majority of people in the lower half of the cognitive divide, whether it comes to conscientiousness, IQ, etc., etc. This is luxury belief at its finest. And really what we can observe when we look at the landscape is one instance after another of the tragedy of the commons because we decided in our lack of wisdom as human apes that this would be the best order of things. But it's clearly not. Yes, there's some nice things that liberal capitalism has delivered to us, absolutely, but it doesn't come without consequences. And sometimes you need to restrain certain things. No, I'm not a communist in case you were thinking that, but we have to acknowledge the downsides of certain things. And here we are. And so, as this tends to be the trajectory we're on, growing ever greater, ever more rapidly, I think it's a safe assumption to make that everything I've been talking about, addiction, obesity, depression, out-of-wedlock children, dysfunctional relationships, that this trend will grow because the trend of lack of constraints is growing. And if you can see a trend in lack of constraints growing, you can also predict probably more consequences that will arise from such a trend. It's unfortunate that we can't acknowledge this, at least publicly, but we do have to at least talk about this privately, as it were, say on my channel and elsewhere. I'm not the first person to talk about this. Religious people do. I'm not religious at all, as you know. I'm about as atheistic as it comes, but you have to acknowledge the necessity of structure, of restriction, and of things that simply make people's lives better. Again, is it better to be an obese alcoholic in your life or at a healthy weight, not addicted, and have friends and family and potentially a community that you can draw upon that gives you a sense of fulfillment and meaning? Is that guaranteed? No. But that possibility for many individuals is much more likely than the current situation that we find ourselves in. As always, thank you for tuning in. Many special thanks to my patrons and donors on PayPal. You guys are the best. You keep the channel alive and going. Without you, this channel would be naught but ash and dust. As for everybody else, if you can leave a like, comment, share, subscribe, be much appreciated. 
And if I'm still alive, I'll check you out next time. Until then, may the gods watch over you. Bye-bye for now. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.